for me, there were just so many intense listening experiences. You know, I could go back individually to so many artists and the discovery of them and um, and, and and the intensity I was involved with in that. I mean, if I go right back to when I was really young and I started to, to properly discover music, it was uh, very much black music that was my first love in terms of um, my brother uh, who was 10 years older and my sister who was six years older were, were buying my brother's buying like, like Stax Atlantic, all the kind of stuff the mods were listening to. My sister was buying all the Tamla Motown uh, and Trojan tracks, you know, the reggae tracks as well. And so these were the records that were coming into the house and I was listening to, you know, eventually I, I you know, I, I, I kind of um, took them myself as they went off to college and stuff and, uh, you know, they became the basis of, of what my collection was. But just listen to that music, I mean, that that. I blogged recently about, well I said, I did an interview a few years ago about, I was asked, you know, like, can you name a track that has a particular, made a particularly strong impression on you, and the, the track that I chose was uh, The Temptations, Ball of Confusion, which was a track from 1970, talked about the times in which people lived, the, the actual musicianship and everything, the producer, Norman Whitfield, one of my favourite all-time producers, The Temptations themselves, as you know, the vocals, the vocal harmonies of them. The subject matter, as I say, was was talking about the times in which people were living, the history of the times, about stuff like the the, the racial situation that was ongoing, uh, political situation, and and as a young kid hearing this, you know, I, I learned a lot from from this type of record about why this music was special because. It went to a deeper level because it was involved with a struggle. There was the, the civil. It was coming out of the civil rights struggle, and um, and it was coming out of uh, the period where black people had taken a stand and were looking to change, you know, the political landscape and and what they'd had to put up with for years and years. And and no more, nowhere more than the music was that apparent. And and. And sometimes it wasn't even in the tracks that had what you might call like deeper lyrics. It was sometimes what, you know, the lyrical throwaway tracks, there was still that depth in the performance. There was still something there that that's connected. And so that, that, that was always there for me, you know, like from, from the off in terms of like an intensity of listening to music, listening over headphones, you know, because obviously back then we didn't have great sound systems. But though that sound system, I listened to the music on first, that was probably the best sound system <laughs> in the world because it was like my machine of discovery, really, you know. Then, you know, like, of course, Bowie, you know, he came along and I became uh, you know, absolutely obsessed with, with you know, his music. So this is the period, the Ziggy Stardust period, 72, 73, where, where I really clicked in, like a lot of other people in my generation, and then started to listen to everything he'd previously done, and obviously the subsequent albums. And I'd say that um, Ziggy Stardust was probably by the time I was like 20, um, the album I'd most heard of, of all that. I'd heard it hundreds, maybe thousands of times in, in, in that period. But I remember being in Germany in 1980, and shall we say, it was a bit iry at the time, and um, and I was at somebody's house and they put on Ziggy Stardust on a really nice system. And it was a revelation because I heard it in a completely different way. As though, even though I'd heard it so much, I could separate. Now I could hear where Mick Ronson was doing backing vocals and you know, the, the instrumental um, aspects of it, who was playing what, where, when. It, it, it's like the whole kind of sound, the sound image like separated into all its various compartments. It was almost, that was the moment for me that the production mind came into play because previously to that, I think I'd always listened to music as a whole. It, it was the whole sound thing. Um, the deconstruction came really maybe just by looking at the lyrics later on but the first hearing it was about you know the whole thing and then you know as i say i looked a little bit more closely into it. but what this did to me was it literally opened it all up it unlocked 
the fact that you know I was listening to something that had probably been recorded on 16 tracks and on each track there was something different like you know as we now know you know or as you know I later you know got involved in production and everything and multi-track recording and everything that's what I know what goes on now but at the time I didn't but I was starting to hear it I was I was beginning to understand it from a different level so that surprised me that something that I could hit I, I, I'd heard so many times could offer something so new to me hmm. even all those years on and that's the great thing I think about music is, is it's it has that power to continually surprise you if you allow it to do that but you have to put yourself in that headspace. Mm. You can't expect to, you know, sit back tweeting and let it go and then for it to blow you away. It's not going to happen. You're going to say, yeah, very pleasant. I like that. That's nice. But you're not going to get any kind of uh, oral revelation off the back of that. Mm. It's like, say, watching a film. I remember like when I was 18, mm. I saw Apocalypse Now and I'd seen the deer hunter before that. And the whole kind of thing with the deer hunter with the Russian roulette made it more exciting. Apocalypse Now was a little bit deep and I couldn't quite, you know, and, and I would have said at that moment in time that, that you know, The Day Hunter was the superior film. But three years down the line, I went back to Apocalypse Now and I got it. It just blew me away, you know, and it's one of my favourite all-time movies. Mm. It's, it's, it's a film, it's not even a Vietnam film. It's, it's like a, a film based on a book, um, you know, Hearts of Darkness about Africa. So... It, you know, from from the eighteen hundreds, so it it it's it's got a wider um, range than than being simply a Vietnam film, as as I'd originally viewed it as, and I was looking for the action, and the action was a little bit of a different kind of action, mm. you know, um, than than you used to in your war films, you know, when you were a kid, you know, but with that little bit of more experience in my life, and a new way of looking at things it opened up completely and it's the same with music it's the same thing that you can hear th that's why you know the like artists that didn't mean that much to us at one point that we could take or leave that all of a sudden later in life you discover them or rediscover them and you and, and the penny drops and you realize why there was this great fuss about them in the first place you know well i mean i, I was reading something from an old 60s underground magazine from Seattle called Helix and in it the reporter he was at that particular point in time talking about this phenomena of what was happening with young people who were buying albums I mean albums at that point for the first time were, were being seen as an artistic statement rather than just a, a quick collection of tracks which were, was what they were previously regarded as and these people were going sitting down in the room really quietly kind of putting the music on and absorbing it and mm. listening to it and it was um, a whole experience um, and it just got me thinking of how much we've lost that in the modern age that people just don't listen to music anymore in, in that respect i.e. giving it the full attention that they might think they are but you'll see that they're texting away or they're on the computer or you know or they're popping up and going out you know and that you know that you wouldn't do that in a cinema if you were watching a film but because music's so much around people all the time they hear it everywhere they go it's just there now that I think they've um, basically lost the ability in, in lots of respects to to understand um, you know the process of what 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 should be happening is that somebody's been in the studio and put down this music and hoping that somebody will sit away and listen to it. I mean, obviously people do that on headphones and stuff like that, but they generally do it um, to to uh, pass the time. So maybe they've got a journey to make. Yeah. Let's put some headphones on. You know, so people aren't just like kind of saying, right, I'm just going to sit down and listen to this album tonight and take it in and absorb it and enjoy it, and um, and that's what we you know, decided to do with Living to Music is select an album a month and say to people, you know, at nine o'clock on the first Sunday of the month, you know, we're just going to sit and listen to it and if you want to join in, do so and if you want to comment on the blog and give your impressions of it. And it all came out of that and the title Living to Music was in that piece, that Helix piece. He said mm. that, you know, people, he, he described it as, you know, people are living to music, that they're, they're putting more in store in that than, than they would in you know, almost like kind of spiritual matters and stuff, you know.
And it's also kind of spun off with uh, Colleen Murphy, who um, who does something called Classic Album Sundays. Mm. And Colleen, I mean, she was doing something similar, but just inviting a few people to a house and having like dinner and listening to stuff because she's got like an amazing kind of audiophile sound system. Um, and it was a friend of mine uh, who, who commented that, you know, what to her, what I was doing. And I think that spurned her on to the idea of um, going, hiring a venue. Um, she did it in a London pub. And initially she tied in with what I was doing, you know, with Living to Music, selected the same albums and everything. And did that whole process, you know, in an outside environment where people could come down, put a beautiful sound system in there and everything. But that's spun off now that she's, she's taken that to New York. She goes mm. into festivals and she does it. She's been in art spaces. Mm. And so that's great, you know, because the, the, the whole point of what I was trying to do is, is promote the idea of listening. Yeah, I mean, the, the pace of life is, is and, it, and it's only getting faster and how, how fast it will go. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of very interested in uh, the author Alan Moore, comic writer. He, he talks about the culture of steam and I very much agree with that, you know, that, that information is, you know, he talks about a theory of information doubling that over, say, 50,000 years, there's X amount of information. They can measure it by the amount of inventions and things that happened during that period of time. But for that to double, it took another, say, 5,000 years. And then it goes onwards like that. So you get to the 60s and information doubles by the 70s. And now we're at a period of time where literally it's, it's, it's getting to a crazy extent where you know, within a matter of years, it's going to be doubling, you know, every thousandth of a second, you know, the, mm. this, and this is what it is. It's the internet, it's the age, it's, it's all there. It's everyone's got a Facebook, everyone's got all the, all the things on there. There's so much, there's too much. We can't take it all in. Mm. And, you know, I talk to friends a lot about, you know, the idea you go on the internet and, and it's so easy to pull you something. It's such an interesting thing. There's so many things of interest on there that you can start, you know, on task looking for something and before you know it you, you're in a completely different realm you're learning stuff but so I, I you know I tend to think it is the trick you know is going to be about bringing things back in and keeping focus mm. on what you're doing being able to find a way to do that and that's a little bit like you know the idea of sitting down listening to music focusing it you can't just like let it just take it'll just take you like the wind and throw you all over the place otherwise so it's finding out what what information you want what's necessary to you mm. and then having the self discipline to be able to keep on track to 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 go for that rather than just be pulled off down the side road and mm. into something else not just music but in general the idea of in this kind of busy world where everything is moving so quickly and the flow of information is is you know, is basically a boiling point mm. that to, to find whatever we can to slow that down. Yeah. You know, whether it being getting back into nature or whatever, or, or you know, something like watching a, a film uh, or, or listening to music or, yeah, and, and, and I say watching and listening, and I mean it in a sense that, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of times, and this is going back, this isn't just the digital age, I, I was saying this to people years ago, I'd say, you know, have you heard such and such a track? And maybe I'd, I'd be talking about a classic track. And they'd say, well, yeah, of course. It's like, yeah, but have you, have you really heard it? Mm. Have you actually given yourself to this track, sat down and they've gone, and you played it and they've just come away and gone, oh, I didn't realise. <laughs> no, I'm not, you know, I've heard that many a time on the radio in the background when I was at someone's house. It was just there when I was having a conversation. But I've never actually stopped and listened to that. And, you know, I was forever, you know, doing that with people. Just say, just, just, just listen, and yeah. it drives me mad sometimes. You sat in the room, and you know, like people, what they consider to be listening, and you know that, you know, like thirty seconds into the track, they're, they're, they're talking and commenting on it, and it's like, no, no, just, just listen, let the track finish, and then talk about it, and yeah. and do that. I mean, it sounds on one level, it sounds a bit draconian, but really, it's just showing the respect to the people who made that track in the first place. Yeah, that's what they would have hoped for that somebody would have give it that time and, and taken it in. It's a double-edged sword really because on, on one level I think the internet's an incredible thing. I think it's amazing that 
somebody can hear a piece of music that they like and find out that it's by, for example, let's say, Roxy Music, and then they can go onto the internet and they can find more about them, they can go to Wikipedia, they can read about it, they can go and see some YouTube clips. That's great, you know, I love that, I love that. I'm not, you know, but in, in, in a previous time, for somebody to, to do, they get that information maybe 30, 40 years ago, they'd find something they like. It was a whole different process. To, they'd, they'd really have to work hard. And a lot of people kind of think that people should still have to work hard. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think it's more about that focus that we're talking about is, is why, why are you interested in this? There's obviously, you know, a kind of almost like a musical tourism ticket off the list. Yeah, I've heard the Rolling Stones now. Mm heard the doors but you might have only heard one or two tracks you don't understand anything about the, the times in which they lived and why it was relevant and why this music was so you know on the cusp at that moment because it's it's like even you know like uh, you talk about sometimes i might talk about say a, a dance track I, for example you know i might mention a track like you're the one for me by d train which was a track from 1982 big club track and nowadays people look back i think it was a disco track but i know that it was the start of bringing in like more electronic instrumentation into dance music it was it was a different sounding track the moment that that came out and the reason it doesn't sound so kind of unique and different is because so many other people copy that formula and followed that and it's the same with films it's like somebody might go back to citizen kane and go yeah it's all right but i don't get it but but they don't realize that it's because it has such a vast influence on every other film that came mm. that these ideas that are in there you know they don't see them as like unique and original and because mm. they're not to, to their eyes because of what they've seen since but when that dropped so you've got to get yourself again into the mindset of the moment and where it's coming from and then you know that you get your nourishment off that the realization you know wow you know they were doing that somebody explained to me um a friend who's an artist he explained to me uh, the, the the he talked about um there being four stages um he called them the the primitive, the classical, the Baroque and the Mannerist. And he said, for example, in a musical sense, the primitive would be, you could say, I mean, it always goes around in cycles. These cycles are always continuing. We're probably at the moment, we're in a Mannerist stage. But if we go back, we could say the primitive stage was like something like rock and roll, raw edge from the heart, straight on, you know. And then the classical stage being the people that took this rock and roll and then started to craft it in a new way, like the Beatles did. And a Baroque album might be of Sgt. Peppers or a What's Going On. It absolutely captures its moment in time. And then you get to the Mannerist stage, which is um, where basically it, it's people who are taking these ideas from the past and, and rehashing them in a sense, which is, a ne you know, it's not just about copying, it's a necessary part of getting to the next primitive almost mm. to, to, to take that round and, and where that really works and he the way he explained it to me was that you know I'm not somebody who's really up on kind of art and stuff you know like you know gallery art and stuff so he, he was explaining that you might be in a gallery and you might be looking at two paintings and your qualitative judgment tells you that they're pretty much as good as each other and somebody would say to you what do you think which is the best you say yeah they're both good the, 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 you know, I can't really choose between one of the two. But then they say, yeah, but that one there, that was painted 50 years before that one. That couldn't have been painted without mm. that. Then it goes like that. Mm. Then you realise, wow, that's that's the creativity. Mm. That's very good, but all it is, is is it's a copy, really. It's, it's um, you know, the real, you know, the real kind of um, spark is in that one. That's yeah. where it, that's that's where it comes from, and and it's the same with music. It's mm. understanding. It's maybe a lot of people don't want to get into music to that level. They just want to hear it and enjoy it, and and most people are like that. Mm. And most people wouldn't be interested in maybe in this modern age in sitting down and listening to stuff. But there's always you know a significant minority of people that w that would benefit very greatly, you know, if they invested a little bit of time within doing that. Well, I think that's always been the case, you know, obviously that's why the pop single was generally th around three minutes in length. Mm. There's a reason for that, is because of people's attention span. Uh, what happened during that kind of 60s era, though, is that 
enough of, of the, the people that were um, more thoughtful about it um, managed to bring this music into a kind of more mainstream environment. It could have, um, you know, in, in, a res in many respects, if you like use the Beatles as an analogy, is that, that they started off doing three minute pop songs basically. That's how it started. Love me and love me do. Want to hold your hand? She loves you. Great pop tracks in out. And that was it. But you know, four years later, they're doing Sgt. Pepper's and they're in a real concept and they're using orchestral music. They're they're drawing from a history of music. It's 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 a whole new thing. The you know they've obviously had psychedelic experience and they're managing to infuse the music that they're doing with that experience absolutely revelation when you think in such a short space of time from one to the other and that brought the ante up because there was enough people that were prepared at that point in time to you know to really listen to to want to listen you know to to want to understand it's that whole going back to what i was saying initially about this magazine helix this is it it's 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 almost like a religious thing. They've got this album and it's just blowing their heads off. What is coming, the colours that are coming out of this, that they want to give themselves to it because it's important. It's culturally important. It tells them about themselves, where they are, where they are like in terms of history at that point in time. And so, you know, that, that changed the ante, you know, that, that, that opened the door for things like Dark Side of the Moon, which was almost like, I always see that in a kind of classical sense, as though like, you know, a Beethoven symphony would, would go through various movements, and it, it, it's in a similar kind of situation, you know, and, um, and so people were listening, or, or enough people were listening to, to music on, on that level, but there was still always those people with the, the short attention span that wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't, wouldn't want to give it more than a few minutes before maybe now there's more of those at this point in time because like we said before it, it's it's so easily available it's just around you all the time that um that, that that they've lost the habit of 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 listening you know of kind of giving that time to it so they want it to do something to them really quickly so they're passive and they want it to do it to them where it's not a passive thing it's not like being passive it's it's being active it's 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 allowing yourself to open up to it, being open to it, and that is an active thing. So it it seems passive because you sat back and but you're there. You've opened your senses. You've said, you know, come in, and so um, maybe you know, like when you mentioned with your friend like that, that that there's something of that there that he's either never been in the habit of of, of you know, okay, I'll go with this. Because it might be, you know, there's lots of records that, you know, like maybe it's a, a five minute record and the whole point of that record and what the artist is doing, it all happens in that last minute. Yeah. Everything else is just building towards that, it's taking you there. Now, if, if after three minutes you go, oh, I can't be bothered with this anymore, it's gone, you've missed yeah. it. It's like a film. You know, you know, not wanting to wait until the, that kind of end sequence where it all comes together. And you're too bored to do that. That's just the individual, you know. And that's a lot of people do want it on a plate in a sense. And it is in the world we are now. It it is very much kind of served up to us in that way with the the idea of like talent shows and but but the the they're kind of put across in such a way that they're not talent that we're watching amazing artists. You hear. <laughs> You know, the hyperbole of you know that is the most incredible performance I've ever seen, and you're thinking, <laughs> did you have you ever seen Aretha Franklin or Ella mm. Fitzgerald? Have you ever seen Frank Sinatra? You know, you're 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 throwing these comments out willy nilly, mm. where it's yeah, it's a very talented kid who can sing in tune, and it's a nice, but let's make a differential between artists and you know and and talented people. It's a mm. completely different world. And that, it's great TV. And you know, on that level, it works really well. It's just that it blurs the lines, and it also what the problem I have it, it does affect popular culture. It, mm. it means that there's so much time given to this, that there's less time given to stuff of more substance, should we say? 
you know, and the reason why you won't get great artists out of this is because straight away they're signing their soul over. The moment they walk in for auditions, they're saying, if I do well in this, you can manage me, you can tell me what to, to sing, you can tell me how to dress. They want, they want fame. These are kids who want fame. Yeah. They, they don't want, um, you know, like, um, they don't want, uh, you know, like the respect of their peers so much. They don't want people, you know, in 50 years time to be looking back and saying, wow, what they were doing. They're not, they're not artists in that sense. They're not kind of, they haven't got that kind of um, approach to things. Uh, they're, they're very much, I'll do anything for fame. They, 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 they just give me the fame. Yeah, yeah. And that's where we are with it. You know, yeah. it's that Andy Warhol famous for 15 minutes. Get me on the telly, you know, mm. let me be a singer. Me, 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 let, let me show myself. And, you know, it's like, it's like say, for example, um, you know, a lot of uh, kids, you know, that you see on these kind of shows, you just know that they've grown up with their parents playing Whitney Houston or Aretha Franklin albums. And, and in this mannerist way that I mentioned before, mm. they've learned very skillfully to copy that. And that's what they've done. They've copied it and then they put them in front of an audience to sing it and everyone goes, wow, wow, what a great voice. But there's nothing original about it that, mm. that's going on. They haven't taken that and made it their own and twisted it and taken it into a different place. Or they haven't done, you know, what, what they should be doing really is they should be utilizing those songs away from a talent show, maybe going and doing a few gigs and stuff, and then bit by bit bringing their own songs. So learning, like like when the Beatles started out, it was all they were just doing all cover versions of of everyone else from Little Richard to Elvis to Jerry Lee Lewis and Carl Perkins and you know and even like you know some of the more kind of musical kind of numbers and and stuff but but all that experience of playing around with all those different forms of music eventually led them towards songwriting themselves and then they you know that's where the the art comes out of it and so this is stifled at source in a sense because the moment they've gone you know and a kid who's done a show like that it's going to be very difficult for them to backtrack after that and be taken seriously you know, by people, you know, who are more interested in music on a kind of deeper level, it, mm. it's a hard one for them to recover from once they've been tarred with the idea of being on, you know, the X Factor or, or, you know, Britain's Got Talent or whatever it is, you know. As I say, as talent shows, and as TV, there's always been TV, there's been opportunity knocks, there's been new faces, there's always been talent shows and people, no problem with that. But now it's taken over to such a level in terms of what happens with the charts, it dominates the chart. And it, 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 it's also, as I say, it, it's the fact that people buy into this myth and believe that these are incredible, you know, wow, you know, the, and they're not, they're just talented kids. Hmm. Well, I, th I think, you know I, know, I know like a lot of people's kind of listening habits with the internet with downloading stuff has changed. They're not downloading as much now. Hmm. I think they're just clogging up their own computers with, with, with stuff and realise that, 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 you know, it's, it's that musical tourism that I mentioned that people go, oh, I love that, I love that, I love that and they're putting all these stuff on there and then they realise two years later when they can't find stuff that they want to listen to that they've got so much stuff on there that they've never listened to and probably never will listen to hmm. and so it's a little bit like you know, streamlining that it, it, it's all about that, it's all about kind of streamlining and, and, and trying to find what it is that really really interests you and excites you and following those things, um, I mean, it's the same as somebody who, you know, who goes to, you know, like a foreign city and sits on a, a tourist bus and, and goes round and thinks that they know that city really well because they've gone and seen the sights. It's a whole different experience to actually live in there and, and walk in the streets and meeting the people than, than, you know, a kind of sanitised, you know, way. So I think people do that, that... You know, they might like kind of download a load of stuff and then think they know the Beatles because they've got like two albums or something or, you know, and, and maybe they've only listened to it once and if that. But but they've ticked that off and they've, you know, who's the next one? And and, and it, it's, it's really, you know, that that is a process. There is a process of just like kind of, and it is a candy shop and it's great for being that, but I think that people have just got to like kind of, work out what they, what particularly connects with them and 
maybe why it connects with them. You know, it might be a certain sound in there, and then they might be able to find that yeah, that the reason that that sound is that way is because they work with this producer. And if they just look a little bit there, they go, oh right, he did that as well, and have a listen to that, and then they might start to discover what it is that's that, that, that they're into. Cause, I mean, music's such a, a subjective thing. It's 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 an individual thing that two people who you could say, yeah, they've both got great taste in music, can be totally opposed over one artist. They could say one can say he's the best thing ever, the other could say don't rate him at all, you know, and and so like. It's it's all about you. It's all about, but but a lot of people are pulled into thinking they've got to go with, you know, like what everybody else likes, and this is the general thing in life. A lot of people just go through their life, you know, pulled around in terms of what they're into musically, just to, to just to fit in, you know, with the mm. contemporaries. Whereas anybody who's really into it on a deeper level will will find their own way and. You know, it's like it's like this thing of guilty pleasures. They hear a lot of people talk about what's your guilty pleasures, and I'm like, I've got no guilty pleasures. It's all out there. I'm not guilty about liking the Carpenters, or mm. you know, it, it, it's great. You know, I mean, what a voice! Like, you know, it's it's you know, it's a bit bit kind of um, syrupy at times and stuff. But that's the nature of what that is. You know, I don't like to separate things like that. You know, it shouldn't be, you know, like you shouldn't say what, what you're into. I always like it when an artist is very upfront about the music. I remember the, the Mondays, you know, I always thought it was great when they did uh, that track Lazyitis and within the track they were referencing things like, you know, David Essex and Ticket to Ride was in there and Whim Away, Carl Blood, you know, <laughs> just all these. But they were unafraid, you know. Mm. There were the musical influences on their sleeve. You know, yeah. and that, that's... That's another thing. So, so people are pulled into music in all sorts of different ways. Often, you know, peer pressures and, and things like that. But to find your own way and your own individuality through it, you know, it, it is a journey. And there's so much out there. And it's just like as a general thing. It's not just a musical thing. It's a whole internet thing. There's so many, so many roads you can take on the internet that it's literally about trying to find what resonates with you on a, a different level not what i think i should like but you it might be i like that why do i like that what is it why is it connecting because it you know if you get to another place it's all about vibrations it's mm. like everything's about vibration we vibrate that's why we're solid is because we vibrate at a certain rate and music is a vibration and that connects with us and that's why one thing might connect with one person not connect quite the same with another person because the vibrations are slight i mean they knew in the 60s when they talk about the vibes and everything it was a bit kind of hippie hippy dippy but there was truth in that, you know, mm. and music plays absolutely right into that, you know, so it affects people in different ways. And, you know, so it's like you find out about yourself through music in lots of ways.